Are you tired of spending $39.99 on your favorite fitness influencers program, trying it out for a month, getting no results, and then just falling back into autopilot at the gym? Have you ever wondered why it seems like some people are able to achieve incredible results while you stay the same year after year? If the answer to either of those questions is yes, then strap in because today I'm going to tell you exactly how I train and how I structure my programming to get results like these in just 90 days. By the end of this video, you'll understand the three key knobs that make up any training protocol, as well as how to adjust them. We'll talk about what I believe the best training split to be is and why that's the case. And finally, you'll understand how you can take this knowledge to design a program and a training protocol that works for you. Also that you can finally get results in the gym and stop wasting money on programming that's not a fit. All training protocols are comprised of three different knobs. I call them knobs because I kind of like to think of them as dials on an amp. If you turn them all the way up, all you're going to do is blow out your speaker. And if you don't turn them up high enough, you won't even be able to hear the music. If, however, you understand that all three knobs exist in a balance, you'll be able to create a tone or a training protocol that works perfectly for you. The first of these knobs is for, well, Volume, pun intended. Volume, as it pertains to a training protocol, is just the amount of work that occurs over a given period of time. You often hear people talking about high volume and low training volume protocols and getting into internet screaming matches over which one they think is superior. Much like most opinions on the internet that people have a tendency to get a little bit butthurt about, there's not really a cut and dry answer to this. As you increase the total volume of your training protocol, a few different things happen. First and foremost, you're usually going to end up increasing the amount of time you spend training. And for many folks in today's busy world, this is kind of a non-starter because a lot of us are lucky to get 30 or 45 minutes a day in the gym. Additionally, we know from the literature that there's a very clearly defined point of diminishing returns as it pertains to volume. Simply put, if two sets gets you great results, there's no guarantee that four sets is going to get you double the results. If anything, four sets might actually inhibit you or take away results. And that's because of something known as MRV, or Maximum Recoverable Volume. This acronym just means simply that past a certain point of volume, your body's not going to be able to recover or adapt to the training stimulus you're providing it, and it will actually hold you back. All that said, generally speaking, I'm pro keeping the volume knob on the lower end of the spectrum. Now, I don't fall all the way into hit elitism and espouse the teachings of Mike Menser as dogma, but I also do believe in doing the least amount of work possible to get the most results possible. To use a Tim Ferrissism, the foundational 20% that gets you 80% of the way there. The next knob is the intensity knob, which is my personal favorite knob. Why? Because I firmly believe it's the knob that actually holds most people back. Intensity and volume cannot both be increased for very long, and actually past a certain point, they have an inverse relationship, meaning that the higher your volume goes, the lower your intensity gets, and vice versa. And now, before some Sigma Alpha Giga Chad in the comments lets me know about his high volume, high intensity training protocol, let me explain. Even the absolute fastest marathon runner can sprint faster than their marathon pace. If they tried to sprint for the duration of the marathon, they would just fail. In the same way, our muscles can't be taken to a point of failure again and again and again, and continue performing or recovering at the same level that they might otherwise be able to. Now, you might train at a relatively high intensity given a particular volume, but it's not going to be the intensity that you'd be capable of at a lower volume. Now, that said, I also don't think it's possible to elicit maximum muscle growth or achieve optimal stimulus with a single working set, like Mike Menser and some of the other hit people used to talk about. For that reason, I tend to believe that the Goldilocks zone is two to four working sets per exercise. Each one of these sets taken to true technical failure, which just means that your form breaks down before you can achieve another repetition. And while I do understand that there is some conflicting evidence as far as whether or not training to failure is as important as we've always believed it to be, it's been my experience as well as the experience of all of my clients over the years that training to failure does have an outsized impact and it always induces a greater hypertrophy response than if you were to not train to failure at all or to only train to failure infrequently. The final knob you can adjust is frequency. Now for decades, the bro split was the king of bodybuilding. Chest on Monday, back on Tuesday, legs on Wednesday, shoulders, arms, etc., etc. Now this is a total frequency of once per week subtracting some of the natural overlap in something like chest and shoulders. And again, speaking in generalities, the lower you turn your frequency, the higher you're going to have to turn your volume and intensity to get the same results. And the opposite is also true. The higher you turn your frequency, the lower you're going to have to turn your volume and intensity in order to be able to recover from session to session. I believe that once per week frequency, like the old bro split, is far from optimal. 
Now, if you like a bro split and it's the easiest thing for you to follow, by all means go nuts, but I just really don't recommend it to almost anybody. Your other options for frequency are usually full body training done daily or five times a week, an alternating split of upper lower done once or twice per week, and a push-pull leg split done once or twice per week. I believe that a twice per week push-pull leg split is optimal for building muscle. It allows for adequate recovery time in between sessions for a target group. You can keep intensity really high while you keep volume relatively low, and it's really time efficient. Now, if you're in the camp of folks who love to train, you can do this six days on, one day off, though I recommend for most people doing three days on, one day off, or you could even do a modified push-pull leg split of two days on, one day off. So knowing that we want a roughly twice per week training frequency for our major body parts, we wanna keep volume relatively low and intensity as high as we reasonably can, we're now ready to start talking about how you design a training protocol. Also, a really key point, this whole training protocol and the way I approach things really only works if you keep a dang logbook. This just means that you write down all of your sets and all of your reps for every exercise of every training session. I just use a simple markdown file in Obsidian for this, but you could go old school with a pen and paper or do it in Notion, however it works for you. Now, this is gonna sound like blasphemy to a lot of folks Folks, but I basically never barbell bench, squat, or deadlift anymore. And if your goal is purely to get as jacked as possible and you're not really worried about strength or functional crossover, I actually don't really recommend these three exercises either. The reason for this is something that Dr. Mike Isretail coined, which is the stimulus to fatigue ratio. While these movements do provide a ton of total body stimulus, they also create an outsized amount of fatigue relative to the amount of stimulus they create. All that's a fancy way of saying it's gonna make it really difficult to sustain a maximum level of effort for the exercises that come after you squat, bench, or deadlift. If size is your only goal, you're much better off selecting an exercise that's going to have a relatively low degree of full body stimulus while inducing a very high degree of fatigue in the muscle group that you're training. And so having said that, those are the kinds of movements you're probably going to see me list later on in the video. For push, pull, and legs respectively, I would design two different training routines. You can think of them as an A day and a B day, where the only differentiating quality between the two is the exercises that you've selected. So if I were to use a push day as an example on my A training day, I might do a hammer strength chest press, a dumbbell shoulder press, dips, meadows lateral raises, and overhead cable tricep extensions. While on my B day, I would do a low incline dumbbell press, a machine shoulder press or a standing overhead press, cable crossovers, one arm cable lateral raises, and a tricep push down. So let's dissect these a little bit. Each workout follows the same pattern here. There's a compound chest movement followed by a compound shoulder movement, something that's a chest emphasis accessory movement, a shoulder emphasis accessory movement, and a tricep movement. Now there's a few reasons why you would design an A and a B training protocol for a push-pull leg split. Most obviously, it just keeps things a little bit fresher as you go into the gym what could be as many times as six days a week. But more importantly, the more often we do a movement, the more skilled we get at doing that movement. And I don't mean skilled in the sense that you get way better at doing a bicep curl. Skilled in this sense means that your body and your brain get much better at recruiting the individual motor units and muscle fibers, and that becomes a more efficient and effective movement for you the more often you do it. Now let's say that you stall out in your logbook on your A workouts over the course of a few weeks, whether it's from sets, reps, or the amount of weight lifted, your B workouts are chugging along just fine. So following the same skeleton that we talked about earlier, I would swap out all of the A movements and start a different A day while keeping my B training protocol the exact same. This provides new stimulus in the areas that have stalled while providing an opportunity to get more skilled at a new set of movements as well. If your B movements were stalled and A's were proceeding along hunky-dory, I would do the opposite. And if both sets of days have seemingly stalled out, I might completely redesign or reselect exercises for both. For sets and reps, I generally approach things this way. For my compound movements, I use as many warm-up sets as it takes to get to a working weight. Now, in this case, a warm-up set, you're not looking to achieve any degree of muscle fatigue at all. I actually usually keep my warm-up sets somewhere between two to six repetitions. This is just to get your joints and body ready to start moving progressively heavier weights. Once I get to a good working weight, on my first set, I'm usually shooting for six to nine repetitions at true technical failure. And then on my second working set, I'm usually backing off a bit and looking for nine to 12 repetitions taken to true technical failure. Now on my emphasis accessory movements, I'm usually looking at three working sets taken to failure, where again, I'm starting at a much heavier weight, 
usually shooting for about eight to 10 repetitions, and then progressively backing off the weight and adding in a rep or two, usually looking to finish somewhere around 10 to 12 reps or 12 to 15 reps on sets two and three, respectively. I typically omit warm up sets for the accessory movements because by the time you've gone through true technical failure training on two compound movements, you're gonna be plenty warm. But you're more than welcome to do one to two warm up sets if you have any sort of lingering injury or if you just wanna get neurologically primed for that particular movement. I follow almost the exact same skeleton for pole days and for leg days, including that set and rep scheme. With only a very slight difference in how I divvy up the exercises on a pole day, and slightly more volume for a leg day because they are your largest body part. On pole days, I'm looking at a compound rowing movement and a compound pull down movement, then an accessory rowing movement and an accessory pull down movement, as well as a bicep movement. On legs, I usually have some sort of compound hamstring movement, then a compound squat movement, an accessory compound movement like lunges or Bulgarian foot squats, an accessory hamstring movement, an accessory quad movement, and then some form of calf training. So once you have all of your movements for both your A days and your B days selected, you're ready to rock and roll. And just a pro tip, I don't actually usually follow push-pull legs, I usually will do pull push legs and that's just because I like to minimize the number of days that I'm putting a lot of strain on my lower back consecutively. In my experience this is an excellent combination of those three volume knobs that we talked about earlier the volume intensity and frequency and I definitely won't say it's perfect or optimal for everyone but over the last 15 years in the gym this is what I found to be by far the most effective. Now Mike Menser believes that the best way to manage your progressive overload was to add a rep to each set with a given weight. If you could swap 365 for eight, then the next week you're going to strive to hit 365 for nine, and you repeat this until you get to 12 repetitions, at which point you would add more weight, and then start over again at eight repetitions. And while this absolutely works, I think it's a bit more nuanced than that, and I think there's actually better ways to approach it. Let's start with the same example that you can squat 365 for eight reps. You've tried for three weeks now to get that ninth rep, and it just never comes. You could decide that you've stalled out and that it's time for a deload or to swap out for a different exercise, or you could just do some quick math. Getting an extra rep at 365 pounds is actually 12 and a half percent more work during that set. And that's a huge leap to be expecting yourself to make every single week. If you were to instead choose to only add five pounds to the bar though, that is going to add about 1.4% of work week over week. And 1% of gains over every week is an extremely reasonable expectation to hold yourself to. And so this is where progressive overload becomes a little bit more of an art than a science. You won't be able to add weight to the bar infinitely or else we'd all be Brian Shaw. And you won't be able to add reps to a set infinitely because then we'd all be able to bench 225 pounds for 50 reps. By alternating between these though, or potentially adding in an extra set, you'll be able to make meaningful progress for years on end. If you do eventually get to a place where you're not able to add a rep to a set or weight to a set, you can always add an additional set, typically at a lower overall level of intensity than you're aiming for in your first, second, or third set. Then over time, you can build this new set up to a similar level of intensity as you're expecting from yourself in the first one, two, or three. Keep in mind though that adding another set is always going to be the most dramatic increase to overall work, and it's really easy to fall into a trap of junk volume here where you've added a set that's really not moving the needle in a meaningful way. And like I said, I typically don't ever like to go above four working sets in a movement, and I really don't like to go above three for a primary compound movement. So you're pretty limited here on what you're able to do as far as adding sets. Over the course of this video, we talked about the three knobs that you're able to manipulate in any training program. We talked about which ones I like to fiddle with the most and why, and how that ultimately results in in my opinion, push-pull legs being the best split available to you. From there, I gave you the exact formula that I use to design killer workouts that allow me to continue making progress over the long term, and we spent a little bit of time talking about how you can think about progressive overload, changing different variables than just adding a rep over time. I would love for you guys to try this. Let me know what you think in the comments when you do. And if there's anything at all I can help you with in your fitness journey, you can find me here in the comments section or on Instagram. If you found this content helpful, by far the most useful thing you can do is to hit that subscribe button. And if you really wanna go above and beyond, you can consider donating to my Patreon. The link's in the description. With that, till next time, folks.